Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of Christ our Lord. Welcome to worship. Today is Palm Passion Sunday as we enter Holy Week and make our way towards Easter. We are so glad that you have joined us for this time of worship. And God's Spirit is here with us uh, as we worship with all that we are. Uh, we have an exciting and eventful week ahead of us as we make our way towards Easter. So I hope that you have uh, found your bulletin and the opportunities for worship and for discipleship and for service uh, that we have before us. Uh, coming up this week, let's see, our, um, our Linton Bible study, The Walk, it will conclude uh, tomorrow evening in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, we'll have a blood drive this week. Uh, that will be on Thursday. You can still uh, sign up, make an appointment to donate blood, or um, you can uh, volunteer your time uh, to welcome those who are coming to donate to donate blood. And if you donate blood, I think you get a really cool Snoopy uh, t-shirt. Um, and uh, a blood drive, Holy Week, is a really appropriate time for us to host uh, to host a blood drive. So thank you for those who will be part of that. Um, let's see, on uh, Friday, Friday is Good Friday, so we will host a, a solemn worship service here in our sanctuary. We'll have a meal before uh, that will be in the fellowship hall. Saturday, uh, we'll have a, a church uh, work day. We'll gather here and uh, just to do our part to care for our space and our grounds and to, uh, to tidy up just a little bit and, and make it extra beautiful as we prepare for Easter Sunday. And so one week from today is Easter Sunday. Uh, we will gather um, at 7 a.m. in the courtyard. I invite you to bring a chair. We'll watch the sunrise and proclaim hallelujah. Uh, Brittany Shook will be leading our music at that service. We'll also have an Easter drama presentation. So I hope that you will uh, start the day with us that way as we worship. Uh, at 9.30, we'll have our Easter celebration, also in the courtyard, so that will be just some fun and fellowship and an Easter egg hunt. And then at 11 o'clock, our traditional worship <laughs> here in this space. We'll bring fresh flowers for our flower cross. We will bring, if you have butterflies at home, you will bring those uh, with you, because after the service, we will have our, our butterfly uh, release as a beautiful symbol of the resurrection of uh, Lord, if you've been collecting coins uh, for our Coins for Lent um, offering and, and service and outreach, you can bring those offerings with you, whether they're, they're coins or uh, some other monetary donation. Uh, we'll be collect, receiving those and offering a prayer of, of consecration and thanksgiving before we give those to our local schools to help offset a student lunch debt that has accumulated. So uh, lots going on this week as we uh, as we worship together and just prepare our hearts for the events that will transpire this week. You'll see in your bulletin other opportunities coming up for outreach and for service. Um, our April newsletters are available uh, for you to pick up. And finally, there is an insert in your bulletin for, for small groups. Uh, many of you are already a part of our small groups, our fellowship groups. Um, but we've seen that there's a need. We go. You've got to see, we've got some new microphones today, and so we're just getting the hang of those. Um, our small groups, uh, we've seen a need for some, some new opportunities for small groups and for fellowship, and also an opportunity for maybe some folks to transition into new groups to form uh, new relationships and, and get to know each other. This is part of our, our spiritual growth and our fellowship and forming relationships with one another. So we invite you to, to personally consider this insert and this opportunity. You can see the, the information about the groups there. Each one is, is a little bit different. They sort of set their own tone and their own schedule, but what a beautiful opportunity to gather together as the body of Christ, to, to know one another, to, to journey with one another. So I hope that you won't miss this opportunity as we, we reconsider our small groups and, and grow them. Again, we're grateful to be worshiping together today, and I'll invite you to join me in our call to worship. We come to prepare for the holiest of weeks. We will journey through prayers with joy on our lips. We will travel through betrayal and death, praying for the in our lives. Jesus will lead us through this week, and we will follow. For he is the life we long for. He is the word who sustains us. We have all branches in anticipation. We lay our love before him to finish this walk. 
Setting aside all power, glory, and might, he comes, modeling humility and obedience for all of us.
they're all happy, they throw down clothes, all that stuff. Why did they throw down their clothes? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, because it was a way of honoring. They were laying down like a carpet for a king. So when there's a king in your presence, you give your best, right? And so I, you get their clothes. Well, if you have excess clothes, it was like their jackets or their cloaks. You know, it wasn't. Did they get their jackets? <laughs> well, I'm sure as soon as the donkey trampled it, they took it home. <laughs> and they took it home and they washed it. So that was just it's a way to honor Jesus with what they had. Right? <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, they were waiting for a king. They were... Um, but, so this begins Holy Week. You've heard of Holy Week? It's like the most important week on our calendar. It's the most important. It is. A lot happened this week. It's, it is so filled with stuff. Well, so Jesus wasn't exactly the kind of king that they were expecting. They wanted a king who would lead an army and would help them with all their money problems and wear a crown and all that kind of stuff. Oh, let's not put people. <laughs> so, um, later on during the week, these same people who were cheering Jesus and were praising him were growing very angry and were not happy with him. So, by the end of the week, they are crying, crucify him, crucify him. How can they turn on so quickly? Yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy. That's how we are, isn't it? One minute we love God, and the next minute we're doing things that hurt God. It's 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 human nature. But thankfully, Jesus, he was willing to to be crucified, and they nailed him to a cross, and he he died for each of us. But, then, but he, he was too strong. He didn't die. Well, he was strong, um, but he gave that up for us. He actually did die. And then three days later, because God is God, he raised him from the dead. And that is what we're going to get to celebrate next Sunday, which is the holiest of holy days. Yes. Yeah, because our Lord who died for us came back to life. And because of that, we have promised. Can we meet him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's, he's all around. He's in our hearts. And one day we're going to see him face to face when we get to heaven. But to get to heaven, we have to... Get old. Yeah, we got to get old. Well, not all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but to get to heaven... Yeah, we do. But to get there, we have to acknowledge that Jesus did die on the cross for each of us. Our Savior. And when we do that, and we ask for forgiveness of our sins, we are forgiven and we will be with Him forever. And with all those we love, isn't that great? Yeah, it is pretty great. Okay, well, um, y'all have an awesome spring break and lots of happening this week. Lots. So pray for me and Pastor Avery because I'm telling you, we are about maxed out. Yeah. I am. Yeah. You are? Okay, cool. Well, you're taking a road trip first. All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we we praise you for all that you are. Um, even though you are so misunderstood, we love you with everything we have. And we just ask that you be with us during this, the holiest of weeks. And help us to realize all that you went through just for us because you love us so much. We love you and we pray to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's go to Children's Church.
I love that our young disciples ask questions that are from the heart. And I love that question, can we meet him? That was from the heart. One of the places where we meet Jesus is in our worship and is in our prayer. Because we know that in our prayer, we encounter the living God. That he hears us when we call to him in prayer. That he draws near to us and that he responds uh, to our intercessions, to our requests, to our joys, and to our sorrows. Many of which he has already experienced himself. So today in our worship, we offer our prayers to God as one body with that confidence that we meet Jesus and that he hears our prayers and responds. We've uh, sent out a prayer list as we do every week with, with joys and with concerns. Uh, and I have one update to that. Our prayer list said that Jim Troll was in the hospital and he has come home. So we give thanks uh, for that and offer continued prayers uh, for Jim and uh, for Nellie as well. You might have joys or concerns that are on your heart and on your mind today. So we will have a moment of silence for you to offer those to God, and then I will offer a prayer for us together. Let us pray. Oh, merciful God, we gather today to meet you to worship you, to acknowledge your amazing grace and your great power. You are our God. We are your people. We worship you today with song and with prayer and with word and God in unity. You are the God of the cross and you are the God of the table. You humbled yourself in surprising ways. You even rode down the streets of Jerusalem on a donkey. You are not the Savior we expect. Your power does not look like the power that we want our God to have. Sometimes your wisdom doesn't make sense to us. God, we are happy to join the crowd, waving branches, but we're not so sure we want to follow you through this holy week into the temple courts, into the upper room, into the garden of Gethsemane, to the high priest's house, to the assembly of elders, to Pilate, to Herod, to the place of the skull, to the foot of the cross. As we pray together, we give thanks for all the places that Jesus went on our behalf. We give thanks for his wondrous love that never Ends. And we give thanks for the ways that we experience that love and that grace. As new life springs up all around us, we open our eyes and give thanks for that new life that we have in Christ. And as we pray together, we lift up prayers for neighbors who are near and far, who are carrying heavy burdens. We offer our prayers of intercession for those who are navigating health crises, for those who are caregivers, those who are victims, those who are lonely, afraid, overwhelmed, and all who are deeply longing for resurrection and hope. God, we lift up prayers for peace and for comfort, for change and for justice, and for your abundant life that really is life. God, even though we know what this week will bring, still we sing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us, God, we pray. Lead us and transform us into disciples, into faith, into hope, into love. We pray in the name of Jesus who has gone before us and who is with us even now. And we join our voices in the prayer that he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we continue in our worship this morning, another act of our worship, a spiritual act, is giving our gifts, our tithes and our offerings, returning to God a portion of what God has first gifted and trusted to us. We give these gifts in ministry and mission, uh, not just of Francis Asbury Church, but God's church, and pray that uh, by doing so, we get to be a part of what God is already doing in our church, in our community, that we get to meet God uh, along the way in our young disciples, in our mature disciples, in song, in worship, and service, uh, wherever we might find ourselves. We will give our gifts today by passing the plates uh, down the offering or down the pews. Uh, we can give our gifts uh, at the back of the sanctuary where there is always a box in the narthex and uh, digitally online through our church website. We'll invite the ushers to come forward.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from, our second gospel reading comes from Matthew, uh, the 27th chapter, verses 15 through 31. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you? Jesus Barabbas, or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole co cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Do you like spoilers? Would you rather know the end of the story? or the movie, or the book, or the television show uh, before you start? Would you rather know how it ends? Or do you like the surprise and the mystery of discovering it along the way? I've shared before that I really enjoy reading. And as a kid, even, I had um, books you know, in, in my room, and I uh, was even caught on more than one occasion in bed with a flashlight after uh, lights out because I just couldn't wait till the next morning uh, to find out how the book was going to end. Uh, during elementary school as a student, I went through a phase where I really enjoyed mystery books. And uh, one phase, I really, I read a lot of Nancy Drew mysteries. Uh, Nancy was this young amateur detective and she and her friends solved lots of mysteries, uh, kidnappings and jewel heists and haunted buildings and, and things like that. And like most mysteries, the plot was wrapped up in the final chapter of the book. But sometimes as a kid, I had trouble being patient. So as I was reading the book, sometimes I would flip to the end and I'd read the last chapter. And then once I knew how the story was resolved, I would go back to my place in the middle of the stories. Although I don't know why, there was never a mystery that Nancy Drew didn't solve. It was always solved and tied up perfectly. But once I was given a Nancy Drew book for my birthday, around eight or nine, and I came to find out the last chapter was missing. It wasn't included in the book, it just wasn't there. And since it was a gift, I couldn't return it and exchange it for a book that did have the last chapter. So I can remember my mother taking me to the bookstore, and I stood there in the children's section with a copy of Nancy Drew, and I read that last chapter. <laughs> Finally, the story was complete. I knew how it ended. A mystery just isn't finished until you've gotten to the last chapter. 
One author says that his process is actually starting at the end. The first thing that he writes is the last sentence of his book. And then, knowing how the story ends, he goes back and he starts the beginning. And he can develop his characters. As Christians and as students of Scripture, we already know how this arc ends. We already know the last chapter. It's not missing. It's not mysterious. We know. As we approach Holy Week, we already know what will take place next Sunday. What we are seeking as we gather is not mystery, but meaning. And as we seek meaning, we utilize rhythms and, and patterns of life and even rituals of worship um, to help pattern uh, our meaning. These are things that, that guide our life together. They're aspects of our faith that utilize all of our senses. We know the distinctive smell of Easter lilies. We know the melody of a favorite hymn that touches our heart and our spirit. We know the taste of a piece of bread that's been soaked in grape juice. We know the sound of water as it splashes into a baptismal font and the coolness of how it feels when we dip our fingers into it on the day we remember our baptisms. We know the feel of ashes and oil being formed into a cross upon our forehead. We know the softness of a kneeling rail where we humble and prostrate ourselves in prayer. And we know the feeling of a palm frond in our hand as we wave it and as we sing. There's something about this day, this day that we call Palm Passion Sunday, that leads us to seek meaning and understanding in a deep and a powerful way. In the Christian tradition and in Sunday worship, this day has become a, a both and kind of a day. Uh, we connect the triumphal entry of Jesus to the other events of Holy Week. It helps us to, to grasp the full story and it keeps us from fast forwarding through the parts that we might prefer to skip over. If we skip over Thursday and Friday of Holy Week, we miss out not just on a significant part of the narrative, but we miss out on a significant part of who Jesus is and what he does and God's transforming work. It can be tempting, though, to flip ahead to the last chapter. Bishop Peter Story of South Africa has said, America is the only country where more Christians go to church on Mother's Day than on Good Friday. During Holy Week, we gather and we remember how Jesus shows us how fully he is with us and how deep his love is. Jesus comes to Jerusalem having set his face toward it and beginning that journey sometime before. And he has planned to celebrate the Passover with his disciples, with his friends. You're probably familiar with many of the events of Holy Week. They were just too numerous to include in this one sermon text for today. But this week, I invite you to, to go home and to take your study Bible and turn to the Gospel of Matthew and read the entire narrative or from chapter 21 to chapter 28, especially before we gather again here in this space on Friday evening. On Monday, Jesus enters the temple and he angrily turns over the tables and he disrupts the corrupt offerings and the money changing that was happening there at the temple space. On Tuesday, Jesus curses a fig tree and he uses that as an illustration for his disciples. On Wednesday, Jesus allows a woman to anoint his feet and he continues to teach about service and about offerings. And on Thursday, which we often call Monday Thursday, Jesus gathers with his disciples in an upper room so that they could celebrate the Passover together. They sit around the table and they share food and drink and the songs and the prayers. And then Jesus uh, gets up from the table and he takes the bread 
and he takes the wine and he lifts them up as symbols of his own body and his blood that will be broken and poured out for them and in love for the salvation of the world. Later that evening, the group will leave the upper room and they'll head for the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus will pray fervently. He was so anxious that beads of sweat appeared on his brow and it looked like blood. And he asked those friends to stay awake with him and to pray with him, but they had so much food and so much drink. And it was so late that their eyelids felt heavy and they fell asleep. And before long, religious leaders came with an armed guard to arrest Jesus. And those friends deserted him and denied him. And he spent the night in a cold and dark prison cell in a basement. On Friday, Jesus was tried before the Roman government and sentenced to death. He was beaten, mocked, stripped, and made to carry his own instrument of execution to the place outside the city gate where enemies of Rome were put to death. And then at three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus gave up his spirit and he died. And he was buried in a borrowed and a gifted tomb before the sunset and the Sabbath began. That is a lot that was set in motion with this entry on Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem. And Jesus orchestrated all of it. He prepared for all of it. And he helped his followers as they searched for meaning and for understanding and for faith. On that Sunday that began Holy Week, he knew a prophecy from Zechariah was fulfilled. The Messiah entered the holy city on a little donkey, and a borrowed one at that. Martin Luther pointed out that Jesus rode on an animal of peace, fit only for burden and for labor. He indicates by this he didn't come to frighten anyone or to drive out or crush anyone, but to help them and carry their burdens. That day in Jerusalem, there was, there was an energy, there were expectations, and there was even irony. Historians tell us that there was another parade that happened that day in the same city. They tell us that throughout the first century, Rome always staged an imperial parade in Jerusalem at the time of the festival of the Passover. After all, what does the festival of the Passover celebrate? It celebrates the liberation of Jewish people from their oppressors in Egypt. And so Rome was proactive at this time every year as thousands and thousands of people came to Jerusalem for the festival. They wanted to squash the idea that this group of people could be liberated again, much less liberated from Rome. So Rome held this military-style parade to flaunt their power, and it was led by the governor, Pontius Pilate. He would ride into Jerusalem from the west, sitting on his war horse, and he would be followed by scores of cavalry and soldiers and banners and weapons, and the entire parade was meant to say, remember who and what has control of life and death in this city. And so with this information, theologians say Jesus knew that this happened every year at this time and in this place. And so his entrance was intentionally different. It wasn't a display of power, but it was a display of devotion. Jesus came from the east, and he entered on a donkey. He was flanked by former fishermen and by peasants. And as he entered the city, the crowd circled around him, and they were able to get close to him. As we learned from our young disciples' time, they, they threw their cloaks in front of him, and they waved their branches, and they called out to him. And it wasn't exactly a cheering or, or woo-hoos like uh, we would think of at a, at a parade that we might go to. Hosanna is a prayer. It's a cry for help. And in English, it means, save us. Save us now. Can we, just, we can picture them crying out to Jesus, save us. Save us now. 
from what is it that they pray to be saved? From what do we pray to be saved? As I read and as I study the scriptures, I find myself saying, I wonder, almost constantly. I think I've told you that before. But there's something to approaching the scriptures with wonder and with curiosity and with the passion for seeking meaning and, and going deeper and deeper in the word and in our, in our faith and in our relationship with the one to whom the scriptures are pointing us. And there's so much that I wonder about that day in Jerusalem. Author and theologian Howard Thurman has said he wonders, what was at work in the mind of Jesus as he jogged along on the back of that donkey? Perhaps his mind was far away to the scenes of his childhood, filling the sawdust between his toes in his father's shop. He might have been remembering the high holy days of the synagogue with his whole body quickened by the echo of the ram's horn. Or perhaps he was thinking of his mother, thinking of how deeply he loved her and how he wished that there had not been laid upon him this great necessity that sent him out onto the open road to proclaim truth. It may be, Howard Thurman says, that he lived all over again that high moment on the Sabbath when Jesus was, was handed the scroll and he unrolled it and he read that great passage from Isaiah, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news to the poor. I wonder what was moving through the mind of the Master as he jogged along the back of that faithful donkey. One of the things that I wonder is who was in the crowd that day? I wonder if Lazarus was there. Lazarus and his sisters after Jesus had called him out of the grave. I wonder if Bartimaeus was there who Jesus had healed of physical uh, ailments. And I wonder about the children, the young disciples. <laughs> Jesus had ensured that they were welcome in his presence. He made sure nobody told them that they were too young to be welcome or too young to be worthy. So did their parents lift them up and put them on their shoulders so that they could look and see as Jesus came down the streets? Were Jesus' siblings there? He had younger brothers and sisters. <laughs> and what about his mother? We know that she was there on Friday at the foot of the cross. Was she watching this scene unfold? And finally, I wonder, was Barabbas there? That insurrectionist who was given life in exchange for Jesus. The one whose release the crowds would just demand. He was someone who, who really did desire to overthrow Rome, and he took action to do so. And incidentally, as we heard in our scripture reading, his given name was Jesus Barabbas. And so on Friday, the crowd is asked to choose between two Jesuses. We know which one they chose. And so what about us? I wonder about us. Where are we? Do we find ourselves in that crowd on Palm Sunday? What about the crowd that was gathered on Friday? The one that cried, crucify him. The one that was still searching for meaning and for understanding and for faith. I wonder, do we still allow the story of Jesus and of this week to surprise us? That Sunday, in the, in the parade, in the entry, in the triumph, nobody expected what was coming next. Jesus does the unexpected. Even now, Jesus does the unexpected. Throughout this season of Lent, we've been talking about the ways that God does transforming work in us. We went all the way back to the beginning and we looked at how God was, was transforming in creation. We've considered how God transforms us into reconciliation, how God transforms doubt into faith, and how God transforms us from servant to friends. And now we come 
to the transforming work of Holy Week, which God does not only in us, but for us. And through it all, Jesus does not waver. He doesn't walk away. He continues to demonstrate faithfulness, obedience, compassion, faith, and love. That greatest love. Love that gives up self for friends. Until the moment where he can say, it is finished. That final word from the cross. In Greek, it's just one word. And the word means it is completed. And in that final word, when Jesus says it's completed, he's not expressing relief that the, the pain and the suffering is over. He's saying, I've completed my mission. It is done. I've done what I set out to do. And in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, Jesus transforms our relationship with God. He transforms life and death, and he transforms what is possible. Even the cross is transformed. Originally a symbol of, of cruelty and punishment and death, it now has become a symbol of God's great love. Because it was such an excruciating death, the Romans a reserved crucifixion for just the worst offenders and those who were traitors uh, to Rome. But no longer is that what the cross represents. And no more is that where we find crosses. Now we find them as part of sacred worship spaces. They're part of sacred art. They are part of body art, uh, jewelry. They are expressions of, of hope and faith and deep abiding love. Bishop Will Willimon says, Christians believe that when we look at Jesus on the cross, we are privileged to see as much of God as we ever hope to see. The cross is not just truth about our human condition, it's truth about God. What we see when we look at the cross is wondrous love. God who would humble himself God who would come to be among us. God who would forgive generously. And God who would empty himself and give in the most sacrificial way. Barbara Brown Taylor said, it is an old, old story. Love comes into the world as a little child, fresh from God. When love grows up, love feeds people. Love heals people. Love turns things upside down. Love's actions do not set well with the people in charge. They warn love to leave well enough alone. Love meets hate, meets politics, meets fear. Love goes on loving, which gets love killed. Not by villains in black hats, but by people like us, clergy. Patriots, God-fearing folk. What brought them together was their rage at him, at love, for being less than they wanted him to be, or for being more than they wanted him to be, but in any case, for not being who they wanted him to be, and they killed him for it. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of life to lay aside his crown for my soul? This is as far as we go today. Later this week, we will revisit uh, Good Friday, uh, the events of that day as we come to the cross. We know the ending. We know the victory. But we're not there yet. We don't get to skip ahead to the last chapter. Between the two pillars of, of celebration and proclamation that are Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday lie the valleys of Gethsemane and Golgotha and the Garden Tomb. We must travel there first before we can proclaim our alleluias. But the good news is that at every step, love is with us. And love never fails. 
Thanks be to God.